Welcome to the Woman's Connection. This is Dane Keller Rutledge, and I recently became the director of this show. For over three years, the producer and host of the program, Barry Louise Switzen, has been presenting a number of topics on women's issues throughout the world. I recently spoke to Barry and suggested that perhaps you, the viewing audience, might like to have a chance to get to know her a little bit better. And so we resolved that tonight I would interview Barry. So, Barry, welcome to your own show. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's nice to be in my own place. <laughs> Barry, I'm curious, what originally gave you the idea for The Woman's Connection? Well, it started by a fluke, my getting into the television business. Uh, somebody was approached to do a program, and it was on business. And I said, oh, great, I've got nothing to do. And I was looking for a job or a business to start. And I said, I'll help you with that. And we were trying to develop that particular program. And while I was doing that, and the bug of television entered my bloodstream, I decided to pursue other avenues when somebody said to me, you know, I'd like to talk about what happened to me in my life and how this particular product I'm selling is so wonderful and do a promo on it. And I said, well, you know, why don't I just incorporate what you're selling with your trials and tribulations and make a program out of it? So that's how the Woman's Connection started, by my saying, okay, let's do a show on women in trials and tribulations. What was, was there one particular person, one particular event in your life that gave you the inspiration to focus particularly on women's issues? It was more of her talking about the fact that she wanted to talk about her. Mm. And I said, well, why not? There's not a lot of programs about women mm -hmm. specifically, and women have got a lot to say, and they aren't really getting out there and saying it or having the chance to say it. Mm -hmm. And it is more of a positive a uh, way of expressing who you are and what you've done and letting the world know that you are not alone in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got this ailment or this problem, but yet with positive thoughts and uh, feedback to your, it, within yourself and from other people, you can overcome the problem. And it's kind of like a sharing of women connecting with other women. So while you might be going through a problem, and you feel you're alone because you have nobody to talk to about it except your immediate family or your doctors, and sometimes we won't go into what doctors will say, yes, 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 just to say, get you out of the office. Mm. Um, there's no real support system on a lot of issues, so I decided to do it on this. And it's kind of evolved more into events shaping women's lives because it's expanded into the fact that I think women in business need uh, to be addressed also, successful women. Uh, this is not the 70s, it's the 90s, where women are making uh, quantum leaps compared to what was happening before. Well, now, where do you find guests? I mean, do you read the newspapers? Do you watch other television shows? Uh, you've had a number of interesting guests that I've seen, and I'm, I'm fascinated by your particular talent of being able to choose interesting guests and the variety that you're able to, uh, to find. Well, my guests come from all walks of life, as you mentioned, and how I get them is networking. I'm great at networking or dialing the wrong number, and that's how I get people. I just People will say, well, what do you do? And I say, I have a television program, and I'm always looking for guests. So people are very forthright in saying, oh, I've got somebody for you to meet, or I'm an excellent guest for your show, and we cipher, um, sip through all the uh, potential guests. So that's how I get them. I noticed a difference um, when you called me on the telephone, and that was a wrong number, as we both recall uh, quite fondly. And uh, normally, of course, if I get a, a wrong number, as it were, I'll just uh, have about a 10-second conversation, and that'll be it. But I recall that um, uh, you were looking for one young lady in right. particular, and then uh, obviously I told you that she was not here and had never been here and was unlikely to be here at the time. and. Uh, uh, you said, well, this, this telephone... You're more interesting than who I was calling. So. Yeah, the call sounded more interesting, so, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, we ended up speaking for quite a while and then uh, got together on this show. Uh, have you ever had any uh, other interesting... Uh, any other uh, phone, calls phone calls that uh, didn't uh, work quite the way you thought they would? Sometimes I have, and it's like, oh, my God, why did I spend so much time on this phone? You know, not really. I think you're the best. Oh, well, <laughs> it's <laughs> nice of you to say. But... Um, no, it's, you'd be, you know, I friend, um, I befriend everybody because of the fact that if you don't, you just never know who you're going to wind up talking to or not talking to. You can miss that opportunity. 
and I'm a great believer in there's no such thing as an accident, as we've discussed right. many times. And I think this is a prime example. You just never know. Or somebody helping you up the stairs in the subway with a package or something, and it turns out they work in the same building or they live in the same building as you are, you're presently doing. Well, so, now that, that fundamentally tantric view of irony that you seem to have, uh, has that been enhanced at all by your travels in Asia? I know you, you're a fond uh, traveler. Well, I love to travel, and I'm quite open to everybody and anything, anytime. And I have a very um, let's, uh, mistress, um, mysterious, mysterious. Well, I like to get into trouble traveling and walking around, and guides always get into trouble because of me, because I like to go where I'm not supposed to. I see. And I'm very open to meeting people as far as finding out about them and who they really are. And it doesn't matter if they're a woman or if they're a man, they're very receptive to me. And I would say more so in Asia because I am Caucasian versus being Asian. Whereas in Europe, uh, they're still reserved, you're still, you know, you're an American. So there's always that persona that they've got a, in front of them and they always have Americans perceived as one way, you know, the, um, loud, boisterous American tourist who's got lots of money to spend, which may or may not be true, so therefore they look at you one way, whereas in Asia or um, elsewhere, even in this country, it's different. If you're open to receive people, you just never know who you might meet. Hmm. I mean, I met some wonderful people in Asia that um, I've parlayed into some business experiences. Well, we were talking before the show. Um I think uh, you were particularly interested in your travels in Vietnam. Right. And it's, uh, it's my thought that certainly I remember the Vietnam era very clearly. And um, we're now just trickling over there, it seems, in the tourist trade and business as well. What views do the Vietnam, Vietnam people hold with respect to Americans now? I mean, not only were we loud and boisterous, um, we maintained a, a war over there for quite some years. Did, did you notice any reactions of people with respect to that? What, what could you convey? Well, it was interesting. If you were in the South, they were very warm and open towards you. Mm. If you were in the North, which was much more, it's still very communist, uh, they're much more reserved. They look at you. Uh, they're not quite sure what to do with you. But in the mm. South, they're, they'll talk to you because they like your money. You know, they're more enterprising. They're, uh, freewheeling and dealing in this north. They're not that way. They don't have this um, entrepreneurial spirit so much. They do, but it's a little bit more reserved. Uh, the are there any restrictions on traveling in North Vietnam at this point? There are not too many restrictions, but you still need a visa to go over there. Hmm. And it's, um, it's opening up more. You'll find more Australians and more Europeans than they do Americans over there. I mean, it, the building boom is phenomenal, and it's a great place to go to visit. I don't know if I'd want to go back so soon, but the people were just really neat. I, one sh story I'd like to share is um, Americans are, I don't consider myself fat, nor do I consider myself skinny, but according to the Asian people, I've got a lot of extra flesh on me. And I had two women that came up to me one day, and it was a riot. Two little old ladies, um, I would venture to say they were probably, oh, 60 years old, if they were that old, or 70 years old. I mean, you, it's hard to tell with the Asian women. And one of them came up, and she kind of like pinched me on my arm to see all my excess flesh. Oh my and goodness. then the other woman just kind of gently patted me on the back, and it was really very funny, you know, because I figured patted out. Patted you on the back? Well, she was kind of like checking me out to see how much extra baggage I was carrying oh, I around. See. But it was very friendly. It was more curious about how much we eat and how fat Americans are versus being skinny, skin and bones. And I don't think, you know, compared to an Asian person, Americans are heavier. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was just very comical. Well, of course, uh, when Tiananmen Square occurred, uh, the hunger strikers were falling mm -hmm. over after about 48 hours because their body fat was so tiny by comparison to Western people. Right. Uh, we think of a, of a two-day fast, and it's not much of anything. But over there, of course, it's very significant. You have an obvious love of people um, all over the planet. Where do you think that comes from? Is there a, a family story you have, or do no. you think you inherit this? Uh, not at all. Father and I used to get into fights about me traveling. That was my, my passion. 
Oh, yes. Was he just concerned about you? No, not at all. <laughs> it, it wasn't a concern. It was more like, you know, stay home, save your money, and go to college. And I said, well, um, I'm going to college. I'm not saving my money. And I remember one time I wanted to borrow some money from him to buy a car. And he said, if you didn't travel all over the world, you'd have money for the car. And I said, you know, Dad, you're right. But I'd do it all over again. And the next day I went out and sold some stock to pay for a down payment on the car. And... Uh, I st I'm still traveling. Mm. I have my car, and well, I had the car at the time. But what does uh, your family think of uh, the show? Well, my parents are all deceased. I my mean, your, your extended family. Well, they think it's great. One of my aunts said it's the best. She said, you finally found your niche. So I want to explore it more and expand on it. Is no one else in the entertainment field in uh, your family? I only have one cousin who's out in California, and she's an actress. Struggling? Struggling actress. Yes. Have you ever had her on the show? No, I haven't. She's never here long enough. I see. Well, now, let's talk a little bit about your goals for where the show will go in the future. What, uh, what vision do you have? I presume you have a notion to expand this format? Uh, I would like format. to expand it uh, to include more uh, segments, do special segments, like do something on employment, do something on business, continue with events shaping women's lives, get something up on the Internet, and really take it worldwide because I feel that the issue of women's, well, women's issues worldwide are basically the same. We were talking about this at dinner the other night about cultural differences. Um, I had a friend in from Paris who was staying with me, and we had a dinner with another woman who commutes between New York and Paris because her husband's uh, Parisian. And when she was living in Singapore, she was talking about the difference in uh, cultural things like they would go out to dinner with another couple and the woman even though her husband was driving and she was sitting in the front seat she had to get out of the car and go sit in the back seat with the other gentleman's wife mm -hmm. and that was standard acceptable custom there now you would never do that here nor would you ever really do it in France but I mean just the little nuances mm -hmm. so it's interesting to find out what is different about America versus Singapore or someplace else You've had so many guests on here who have talked about their own personal views on women's issues. Uh, what one or two issues that you've dealt with in your own life do you think uh, are most significant for women in America? That's a tough question. I think the issue of employment is very difficult uh, because women are always getting shortchanged. Even today they're getting shortchanged. It is a known fact they're underpaid in comparison to a man who has the same job. The other issue is, um, oh, good, it's escaped. Employment and business. Uh, women are not treated with a lot of respect that men would have. Is this something that you've, you've faced yourself? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole, there's two sets in the working world, whether you're a man or a woman. It depends on what you're applied. And that's very humorous when I get a wrong number and they're looking for Mr. Barry, well, it's not a wrong number, so to speak, but it, they're looking for Mr. Barry Switzen versus how they react when they find out that my name is Barry and what they're trying to do, whether it's in business or in a social setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, one time I had a cold and I had such a deep voice that was five minutes before I told the man, you're talking to a woman, and he almost died huh. because he kept calling me Mr. Switzen, and I finally corrected him. I and guess. there was a difference, a real difference in his attitude. Hmm. Where does the name Barry come from? I mean, it is an, a an unusual name for a woman. Well, I'm finding out there's more Barrys around this world than ever before. Hmm. Uh, in the Jewish religion, you're named after somebody who's deceased. My, I'm named after my grandfather, whose name was Harry, and because there's Henrietta and Harriet and Helen already in the family, they just um, came up with Barry somehow. And I always forgot to ask my mother how she came up with it. Now, you mentioned something about the Internet in terms of where the show was going to go and you were going to try to take it global. Did you mean global over the Internet or some sort of I do sexy global. channel that's <laughs> going to take it all over the world? I like to do a sexy channel all over the world. Uh, I like to have a, the television show broadcast all over the world, and I like to have the Internet all over. Hmm. And that takes a lot of staff. Yeah, well, now that uh, we're looking at perhaps 500 channels on the interconnective uh, television entertainment universe, I imagine there will be a lot more opportunities for this sort of thing. 
Well, I hope so. I don't know if there will be because there, everybody's been talking about 500 channels for quite a while, but that doesn't mean that we're getting to 500 channels. Mm -hmm. Barry, thanks again. Thank you, Dane, for Pleasure. being with me. Thank you. Please stay tuned. You are watching The Woman's Connection. Welcome to my show.